Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated and Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome. Access to Democracy returns, and it's kind of exciting uh, for us. That's the first time we've used the new opening with our sponsors, uh, Thomson Reuters, our rock and our redeemer, and uh, now Firefly Credit Union, used to be U.S. Federal, and Dr. Charles Crutchfield. And we have another rock with us. Here's a man who traveled all through South America, got back to Minnesota yesterday, and that's Honorable Paul Anderson, Supreme Court Justice retired, who has been busier since his retirement than he ever was, I think, on yeah. the Supreme Court for 19 years plus. It's a fun it's busy. It's, it's a, a fun, fun busy. Yeah. But <clears throat> in any event, welcome back. Glad to and, be here, sir. Uh, the timing is, is so interesting because as we sit here on the day that the body of the Bison late Justice State. Scalia lies in repose in the nation's capital, actually in the Supreme Court building, uh, really, and his funeral is tomorrow, you actually spent some time with him on several occasions, but most recently only a few months ago. Well, when he was here in October, <laughs> Uh, spoke at the University of Minnesota. I met with him earlier in the morning, uh, about 15 of us or so, and then I went to his speech. And then uh, the reason you have this book up here, uh, Alan, is that as I edited one of his latest books on uh, statutory interpretation. And uh, I think we can get a close-up of that book. <coughs> this is the latest and I guess the last of books written by him anyway. Uh, yeah, I think they were working on another one. I don't know if it's ready. Uh, I mean, Brian Garner and uh, Scalia had a good working relationship, so there could be one that incorporates some later thinking on his part. Now, there have been a tremendous amount of reactions to the death of Justice Scalia. Some of them are so beyond the pale uh, that I just find them so distasteful. A man I, I rarely agreed with in terms of his judicial philosophy, but some of the reactions uh, were really, really just beyond anything I could imagine. Uh, civility, we see, is just a, a lost commodity in this society. But you would think a Supreme Court justice, a man who served as many years as he did, deserved a little bit more than that. Well, first of all, uh, I 
was not a big fan of Scalia's. I didn't agree with his approach to the Constitution. But he is deserving of respect. He is truly an iconic figure in the history of the court and the way he uh, influenced the court and moved the court. I mean, he is a historic figure. And, but it was, he was a lightning rod. He became a iconic symbol for so many people whose thinking he reflect and for those who disagreed with him and the how of his disagreement made him a uh, point where people just responded strongly. Now people say the same thing about uh, Paul Anderson who's retired for two years now but they say that the mark that he made on the Minnesota Supreme Court and his decisions which spread far beyond the Minnesota Supreme Court made him not only an icon but one of the most respected jurists in the country. Now where I think you have a little bit of a problem, now you have <coughs> talked about mandatory retirement before and even lamented that I retired at age 70. I think that maybe Justice Scalia is a good argument for maybe there should be some retirement because the latter years on the court he became kind of a caricature. Uh, people were waiting for his wording. Uh, an example on the Obamacare case, I mean, many of the people I talked to predicted it's going to be 5-4, it's going to be 6-3 in favor of Obamacare. But they said, but I can't wait to hear the scathing dissent coming from Scalia. A court should not set itself up, so that is what people are looking to. Well, he became much more political, overtly political, in the last decade of his life than he did earlier. And I'm not saying that he didn't uh, express his philosophy in speaking engagements and things like that, but he carried it into really well, the judicial realm. If you look to the roots of some <laughs> of that, it really goes back to the Bush versus Gore opinion and his, uh, it was the Saturday before, I think, the Tuesday of the final opinion of the court. And he uh, wrote why the, any counting should stop. And he basically, the bottom line of it, and I'm familiar with that opinion because I had to analyze it carefully during the Coleman Franken thing. He said, we're going to stop counting because we don't want to run the risk that Gore could be ahead in the counting when we make our finals. I mean, in effect, you, you yeah. read that opinion and that's <coughs> basically what he says. And, and, and he was... Of course, a believer of the Constitution. Uh, the old Constitution was what he described it as. It wasn't a living document. It was there and it should be followed. Definitely would have left uh, the Gore case, of Bush v. Gore, to the states. Yes. And had the state followed through, actually Gore won that election by a half a million votes. Well, I'll, I'm going to maybe dispute you. I'm, I've spent time in the Philippines with uh, Gore's, <laughs> one of his attorney, and he said that, you know, it's, you know, voting is speaking and being heard. And surely those who spoke in Florida favored Gore. But the hearing part is that they have to be validly cast ballots. And one of Gore's attorneys said that, you know, if they'd done it right and everything else, Bush might have prevailed by about 300 of the validly cast ballots. So I'm not going to say that <coughs> Gore won or Bush won. It's the procedure that was followed by Scalia. And it was very overt. And it was so contrary to some of his earlier decisions. And this is where I had a problem with uh, Scalia at the end. You know, he would be confronted with the, the, I will say it's even to the edge of hypocrisy of his view of the law, and his answer became one of just get over it. And he became very acerbic also. Oh yeah, very and acerbic. And denigrated his fellow justices That's in some of his decisions. Uh, and, and so when you, when you don't, and when people ask you valid questions about how you follow the Constitution, uh, the answer can't be get over it. I mean, you should, you know, 
explain why he did it. And that was, he found an increasingly difficult problem to explain his jurisprudence that way. So he had this response. And so that was um, part of my dismay. A bizarre opinion was the University of Texas case only last year or the year before <coughs> on uh, minorities. And in addition to that, we had Citizens United. In addition to that, uh, we had the fact that there is no more racism in the United States, another five to four vote, which I think uh, anybody the who's black. Yeah, well, the civil rights and the voting, the voting cases. And see, what some people understand, <coughs> don't, don't understand, and I'm going to be trying to be very clear about it, is the term activist judge has become almost an epithet. And, uh, but you look to its roots is that Scalia really turned out to be a very activist judge in that his willingness to disregard some longtime history and precedents on the court in order to support his view of originalism and traditionalism. He would say, I'm not being an activist because I'm just going back to the way the Constitution was in 1787, but... And everybody should have a musket. And, mm. well, I'm... I'm you know, everybody should be able to have a flintlock musket. I Do you know? So. You know the history of this is that the, you know the Second Amendment. Virginia wanted to have that amendment in there because they were concerned about the ability of the state to put down any slave uh, rebellion, and they weren't confident that the federal government would provide the funds to arm a state militia, and so they wanted to have the ability of a militia to bear arms. And that, you didn't mention this. I think his Heller decision, you know, the, he joined, joined that about on guns, was uh, probably quite, quite activist the way he, now, it's not that, I'm not going to say he's right or wrong, but if he's a traditionalist, he should have come out the other way. If he's side on the evolving law and the way gun rights have evolved since the 1970s, you could maybe right just, he was. Yeah. You could justify his opinion. But <clears throat> don't say you're doing one thing and you do another. That's where I had some of my main disagreements. I thought he was uh, inconsistent and sometimes uh, a bit hypocritical in the way he used his traditionalists and originalists to justify his view of the but law. But nonetheless, an iconic figure uh, in terms of <coughs> Almost 30 years on the U.S. Supreme Court, he certainly did much to shape that court. Oh, into a real giant, today. a real giant. And <clears throat> the interesting thing about Scalia, other than the fact that, and I think his death is premature, and he was not, the, I mean, Scalia is the type of person is that if the consequence were to, he would enjoy the discussion that's going on now and about, his role and how it's viewed and whether he would be, I mean, I would just love to hear him comment on all that's going on, the good and the bad and the ugly of his uh, post ethic. You always talked about the good relationship amongst the judges on our Supreme Court, uh, <clears throat> and yet you had divergent views on the law, and certainly the same is true, for instance, with Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who are very close. Very close. Uh, who traveled together on occasion. And, and went to opera family. together. They enjoyed yeah. it. And see, this is one of the things or where... Elena Kagan, yeah. who uh, he took shooting when they had a whole discussion that they right. got into about uh, the Second Amendment. He took her skeet shooting. Yeah. And <laughs> he complained. He said, you know, all she got was a deer. He said, you can, <laughs> you can get one of those in my backyard, you know. But... Uh, but the other interesting thing is that the funeral of, is being attended by Joe Biden, as was the president, and, and the president's concerned about his security footprint. But Joe Biden and Scalia were friends, and they enjoyed each other. See, this is one of the things that maybe uh, Scalia was able to get away with some of his things with respect to his, his Serbic comments on college, whatever, because he was a very friendly genuine and so all people could say well that's just Nino and excuse him for that a smoker and a drinker and uh, a man who shouldn't have died at 79 years of age remember now Hitler <coughs> was a vegetarian 
uh, Churchill was a smoker and a drinker. So the fact that you know you have those two contrasting, who is the greater man? And and Scalia is going to be remembered as a great justice. He'll be remembered for his writing skills, his intellect, and his wit. And uh, yes, he will be commented on because of his uh, other characteristics that are problematic, but that makes for an interesting person and makes for history. Now, another part of the retirement of Paul Anderson uh, involves his involvement in the Capitol restoration. And <clears throat> I guess we could be the first, since this program won't be released until Tuesday, to discuss the report on the Capitol restoration, where are we and where are we going? Well, uh, mm. good question. Where are we and where are we going? Uh, the commission is going to be dealing with a, the preservation commission is going to be dealing with a preliminary report prepared by the arts subcommittee. We have, I think, uh, 148 works of art in the Capitol. Many of them placed there at the beginning of the 20th century. It is really kind of a memorial to the Civil War veterans. But it was a different time, a different attitude towards the Native American, the American Indian. And so uh, what we're doing, uh, we know that the statutory responsibility on the restoration rests with the commission. We're giving a preliminary report where we're going. And here's some things. We're, uh, we're going to comment on the space that's available, and we're going to highlight Minnesotans love their capital, and they should. This is an iconic, historic, one of the marvelous pieces of architecture in the public buildings of the United States. And so, and Designed we, by a great architect. Yeah, and by it was, oh, Alan, the fact that they're doing the memorial for Scalia in the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. That was designed by Cass Gilbert. Who and so, did our capital. Uh, yes, and here we have, today we're talking mm -hmm. about the Alpha and Omega of Cass Gilbert's iconic public buildings. The Minnesota State Capitol, his first major commission, and the U.S. Supreme Court building, his last major commission. He had a lot of work in between. So, uh, but. The interesting thing is, is that we're dealing with art. It's uh, there's been a lot of change over a period of time. I mean, there's a lot of celebration of art of the Civil War. Cass Gilbert really didn't want that there. He was more in the Beaux Arts tradition, coming out of the Chicago World Exposition of 1893. You have, you know, uh, romanticized uh, Greek and Roman figures and allegorical things and uh it's some of them <laughs> you know could i just say we we have a maybe too many bare-breasted women because that was the style that was at mm. at that time it was prevalent then yeah and uh, but <clears throat> now we have some paintings that have engendered much discussion father hennepin the falls of saint anthony the treaty of the traverse de sioux and uh, we're dealing with a concept which is called privilege of space, okay, or privilege of position. Surely those paintings belong in the state capitol. They were, they're uh, historic, they're representative. Whether they belong in the governor's reception room where major announcements are made or major negotiations take place, uh, that's another question. Take a look at this. We have 12 nation state tribal units in the state of Minnesota. They deal with state government, they negotiate things, and sitting under a picture of Father Hennepin at the Falls of St. Anthony uh, with what they view to be an inaccurate, his, both historically and offensive display of Native Americans, maybe that's not the right place. It should maybe be some place where it can be talked about, explained, same well, way with the Traverse to Sioux. The members of the commission had to really talk about and or argue about all of these pieces of art and yeah. where they should be distributed. And <clears throat> this is in addition to the rebuilding 
Yes. Which is what yeah, I, I it, look it, upon it it's as. It's going to be magnificent, Alan. I mean, the restoration of this building is. Uh, but you talked about a you you, couple of key so consequences. The discussion, maybe not argument, and there's going to be an evolution in how we view I was announced as being chief judge of the Court of Appeals in front of the Travis Dessou painting. And I was very proud of that because I have one is that. I mean, I was in the governor's reception room. My ancestors came here in 1855 as a result of the Treaty of Travers de Sioux. That's where the land was available. And is it, it was very historic, and I was kind of vested in that painting. I pointed to it. My thinking has evolved. Uh, if given a choice now, I would just as soon not have the announcement to my position, to a statewide position in front of a painting that to a significant number of Minnesota represents an effort where they were deprived of their land. Uh, they viewed, there were different versions of the treaty, by the way, they didn't get a, and so maybe that's not the best place to be. You can't deny history, and it's got to be there. Uh, but maybe that's not the best place it can be explained well, and interpreted. As I listen to some of the presidential candidates this year, I think you can deny history because some of them just don't recognize, uh, and I won't say who I think doesn't recognize, but of course, when we have somebody who takes on the Pope and denigrates the Pope, uh, this would be an indication that that candidate thinks that he is God uh, because that's the only person above the Pope. Well, you know the difference between Trump and God. No. God knows he's not Trump. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. I'm not a big fan of but but it's kind of appropriate in context of a discussion with the Pope. And One thing I did want to discuss with you, now there's been a, a large makeover in the Minnesota Supreme Court uh, because you stepped down, uh, mandatory 70. Yeah. Alan Page stepped down, mandatory 70, who I might mention was still hasn't been on this show. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to get him here. And we have two new appointees from the governor, both of whom you're familiar with. Tell us about uh, the you're talking evolution about, of the uh, Minnesota uh, Supreme Court. I've already talked about David Lillehog, so I won't revisit that. He's being a good justice. But you have Natalie Hudson and Margaret Chudich. By the way, now the court has a balance of four men, three women. I like that uh, balance. I served on a court with a majority of women for a short period of time, but I like that, that balance. Here's the key thing that, to keep in mind with respect to Justice Hudson and Justice Chudich. They are solid, decent people and have sought, you know, public service for the right reason. That goes a long way in being fair and just in, in that position. I think that you would define both of them as being surely centrist, if not uh, more on the progressive or left-leaning side. I think Margaret Chudich is maybe more progressive in her judicial thinking than is uh, Natalie Hudson. Well, her background would uh, yeah. sort of indicate that but also. They, uh, they both care <laughs> about doing justice, but they also care about doing the right thing. And so uh, I think that they will serve the state of Minnesota very well because, bottom line, they're decent people, they are intelligent, they, have, uh, they care about the law, how the law gets developed. And so, you know, Alan, nobody's irreplaceable. I'm not irreplaceable. Everybody else, we're going to, uh, people are going to talk about missing me on the court. They're going to talk about missing uh, Alan Page on the court. That's appropriate and fine. But hey, we move on. We have no One of the things that there has been consistency with the Minnesota Supreme Court is that it has been respected nationally and internationally as one of the best courts it is. In, in the, I guess, world, uh, if we put it on that level. <clears throat> and with the right governor making appointments such as the two you mentioned, it's going to remain that way. And we have another fine justice, Justice Strauss, yeah. who is a fine, decent human being and a good man. Uh, philosophically, he's much more on the right 
uh, than the two new justices. Yeah, but, you know, Strauss probably got as long as well with Page and myself on the court as anybody, anybody else. And the thing Which is, you, that, you have mentioned many times, as has he. And the thing is that <clears throat> there's not a single justice on the court right now was not aware of that reputation of the Minnesota court and wants to preserve that reputation and will do their best, well, whatever their jurisprudential view is, to maintain that integrity. And by the way, it's a collegial court, too. And Mimi Wright, who was a short-term justice, is now a federal judge. You uh, know what Mimi Wright's main problem was? She's a fed. She started out clerking for, I mean, she's very bright, hardworking, but her early experience was with a federal circuit district court judge. And once you get infected with that, you know, with that system. You think federally. You think federally. And I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm state. I mean, and I, that goes back to Jim Rosenbaum. I, as young as we were in our 20s, graduating from law school, I could identify Jim as a fed me as a state-oriented person. It's just part of your DNA and who you are. And so uh, she is going to be a very good federal district court judge, and it's probably a natural evolution that she should wind up there. We have two minutes left. Uh, what do you see in terms of a judge being appointed to replace uh, Scalia? A couple of things. One, Obama has a constitutional duty to fulfill his obligation to make an appointment. I can understand why the Republican senators and what are, are saying what they're saying. I can understand it. I do not respect it because they are abdicating their constitutional responsibility. Now, what Obama will do, and by the way, Sandra Day O'Connor, Republican appointment and uh, came conservative out forcefully oh, today. She, she came out strongly <clears throat> saying is that you don't want gridlock on the court. The president should find somebody. And the other thing that's emerging, and this is what uh, Obama will do, he will select and nominate the best person for that position under the circumstances. Now you say you see that Amy Klobuchar, senator of Minnesota, is mentioned, and she should be mentioned. She's got the qualifications, but she not may not be the best person under these circumstances because, as good as she is and as well respected in the Senate, she will have colleagues come up to her. Amy, you know I like you, Amy, but this is part pure politics. I'm going to vote against you because she's identified as Democrat as opposed to Republican. Obama will choose somebody with impeccable credentials, who is not as liberal as maybe he would want to do, but will serve the state and has high qualifications. And the Senate, quite frankly, has an obligation to go forward with hearings. And if they don't find there's some deficiency, they have an obligation to endorse. Obviously, to be continued, Honorable Paul Anderson, one of our favorite guests, thank you so much. And we have to pick this up and continue it in short order. Why Thank do we you. always run out of time, sir? I don't know. No, it's just we both like to talk. I guess so. We hope it's interesting. Okay, Mike. You did. Down. This is one of your better interviews. The way you structured it.